So, as you can see, we're having the per church painted, in case you missed that. <clears throat> and on Thursday evening, Ann and I ran over to Home Depot in Hadley to pick up, I hope, the last of the paint we'll need to buy. And we came back to the church to drop it off. Ann forgot we were stopping at the church, so she ended up pulling, a, pulling into the uh, um, town hall parking lot and making a swing around. And there was a cop sitting right there on the side of the road as we swung around, and she came up here and into our parking lot here, and that policeman came right up and came in right behind us. And I turned to Ann and I said, isn't that nice that they're coming to help us carry the paint into the church? So he stopped and we got out of the car because I still have my wounded finger and my wrist wasn't doing that well. And uh, Ann, you know, with her surgery, she shouldn't be picking up five gallon barrels and uh, pails of paint. And we had two five gallon pails. So we got, I got out of the car and the officer got out of his car and I said, so you've come to help us bring the pails of paint into the church. Thank you. That is so nice. And he said, sure, happy to do it. And he came over and very nicely grabbed a five-gallon pail and brought that in the church. And then up comes another officer right behind him. I was thinking, oh, we're really in trouble now. They got two of them. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, it turns out they did lug the five-gallon jugs into the church, which was really nice. And it turns out that he had come because I have a license plate light out. And I didn't know that. And so he just wanted to let me know. I said, okay, now that you've done your good deed, you can give me the ticket. And he said, oh, no, you will be fine. Just get it fixed. Well, afterward, Ann pointed out the irony of this situation. That two policemen are lugging in these five-gallon, doing a good deed, these five-gallon jugs of paint, pails of paint, into the church where five inmates from the jail are going to use that paint to do a good deed to paint our church. Ironic, isn't it? But is it really ironic? It's only ironic if we consider these two groups, the police and the inmates, to be different in some very essential way. Now, within our society, of course, they're different in a very essential way. The police are peacekeepers. They're protectors. They protect us from the likes of those who go to jail, who commit the crimes. And so there's a huge difference between the two. But if you look at them as human beings, and our sermon today is on our humanness, as you can see, together in our humanness. If you look at them as human beings, aren't they truly very much the same? I mean, here we have two policemen who are doing a nice deed carrying the carrying the paint into the church, and here are five inmates from the jail who are doing a wonderful deed, painting our church, spending days and days and days doing that. And just a couple days earlier, they had carried in four five-gallon tubs of paint, just like the policeman had carried two tubs of five-gallon paint into the church so that I wouldn't have to hurt my injured hand in doing so. Plus, I don't really have the strength anymore to carry five gallons of paint. So they both did these kind things, but that's not the limit of their sameness. In their humanness, they both groups have the same sorts of human desires, the same kinds of weaknesses, the same tendencies toward sinfulness, and at least to some degree, the same desires to do good which we are seeing right now in this church. If there were not goodness in the inmates, would they be here painting our church? No. No, they'd be being miserable, right, in the jail and not willing to help because there's no goodness in them. Why would they help if there's no goodness in them? Why would they bother? And when I talk with them, when I come and drop paint off, or Charlie came and dropped pizza off on Friday. 
they're regular guys. They're really nice guys. You stand there and you chat with them. They smile. They have nice comments. You know, they so forth. They have shown that they care about their work. They have pride in their work. And they're just guys. They're eager, they're eager to help, and they do, want to do their best. But most importantly, beyond that, they are like us, just like us, God's creations. They're God's creations. And they have been given the same offer of grace and salvation that we've been given. The very same offer. Salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this morning, as we move along in our sermon series on unity in Christ, we take up this topic of humanness, of goodness and sinfulness. This sermon, as you can see, is titled, Together in Our Humanness. We are here all together as fractured, broken human beings. And what does that mean for our church in, in church unity? We will look at how we as human creatures <clears throat> are more alike than we are different. We'll talk about how Jesus calls us to forgive one another, just as he forgives us of our even greatest sins. And that in spite of our failings, we show love to one another. How Jesus asks us to encourage and help one another to grow in our Christian faith as the Spirit works in us. To be helpers of the Spirit, not hindrances to the Spirit. <clears throat> so let's start by looking at Romans 7, 14 to 20. And this is, I just love this passage in Scripture. I've loved this passage since the first time that I read it. Because Paul is here arguing in his letter to the Roman church, that the law is a spiritual gift from God and is righteous, but that we as sinners are incapable of following that law to the nth degree. We're, we're incapable of doing everything the law told, the law of Moses told the Israelites to do. We are still today incapable of doing that. And that failure to be able to do that makes us condemned in our sin. So in these verses, Paul looks at his own sinfulness within the context of the law of Moses. And he says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it but it is sin living in me that does it. So what strikes me first about this passage of Scripture is it's confusion. I mean, it just seems incredibly confused, doesn't it? I do what I don't want to do, and I don't know. You know, it just goes. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason why Paul made this so confusing to read, and that, that is because this is the confusion, the dilemma that every human being is dealing with, is stuck in. We're all stuck in this confusion, this dilemma of our God's goodness versus our baseness, our lack of goodness, our sinfulness. Since the very first sin in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, human beings have been fallen. We're born fallen. I know that's not a, a popular idea that 
children are born fallen. I've had arguments with mothers of young children over that. But you've seen children as their little, mine, 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 right? I mean, there, there is this definite need for pleasing oneself as a child, obviously. We are born into that. Spiritual and physical death is what comes from sin. And there's nothing that we on our own can do about that. It just, it is a fact. Spiritual and physical death come from sin. The Bible teaches us that. We can try all we want to be good enough to make it to heaven, but it's not going to happen because we are sinful creatures. We will fail. Now, we may not fail every time we try to do something good. I mean, that's, the inmates are here painting our church. That's good. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing to do. So we have goodness in us. But we also have this base nature that is constantly pulling us down. And ultimately, that sinfulness prevails within us. And that leaves us, like Paul, ashamed, guilt-ridden, and babbling confusedly, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out for I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. We keep falling into that as we go along in our life. Thankfully, as Paul also points out in this discourse, on the law and sin, there is a way out of that horrible situation. And that way out is Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, God created the law. You have to wonder, why did he create the law? Well, he created the law knowing that human beings would be incapable of following it, that all would fall short, but he did it for a reason, as Paul says a few chapters earlier in Romans 3.20b, he said, God created the law so that through the law, we become conscious of our sin. God knew that humans needed the law to even know that we're sinners. Otherwise, we'd be driven by this self-desire, desire for um, self-satisfaction, self-gratification, and we wouldn't even know that we're sinning. The law establishes the right and the wrong of things, and although we are not capable of completely following it because of our sinful nature, we at least can make the effort. And by making the effort for right and wrong, if we make the effort to do right, that at least makes the world a little better place than it otherwise would be. There is, after all, <clears throat> a good reason why Moses' statue sits atop the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Because that law that Moses brought is necessary for society to function, for people to get along well enough for there to be a society. So what would life be like if there were no absolute right or wrong? That's what God gives us through the law. The absolute right and wrong. This is right, this is wrong. Plain and simple. So what would life be like if that didn't exist? If each person determined for themselves what right and wrong was? Can you imagine that? In Genesis 6, 11 to 12, during the time of Noah, we find out what that would be like. It says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Everyone on earth was living for themselves. So much so that what happened? God destroyed them all. He saved only Noah and his family. Just wiped everybody else out. Too late. They had fallen so far. 
course, that was a long time ago, right? That couldn't possibly happen today, right? Well, think back two summers ago. In America, right here in America, right after the death of George Floyd, what happened? There were riots in the streets. Cars were being set on fire. Stores were looted. Damage of all types was being done. People were being injured and killed. And what did many people say about that? It was just fine. It was justified. Because there was a purpose in having those riots, those expressions of protest, those actions of violence and hatred, injury and death. There was a purpose to it, it was important, right? Really? You remember people saying that on the news? You remember more liberal, progressive type people saying, yeah, it's okay. Whatever happened to Martin Luther King's call for nonviolent protest from the 60s and early 70s? It's all, pretty much everybody here should remember that, not the kids up the back, but everybody else. Nonviolent protest, making a stand without hurting anybody doing it. Well, King based his nonviolence policy on the moral authority of God. Remember, he was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Reverend Dr. And so he took the precepts of God. And protest is okay with God. But hurting people in a protest is not okay with God. How many people today even consider that there is moral authority? In our world today, our politicized, our, I don't know even what to call it, postmodern society, more and more people believe that morality is what you think it should be. Isn't that true? And we see it happening in our schools, in our institutions, in our government, and so forth. It's a sad state of affairs. So, if failure and falling short is the lot of us as human beings, and if spiritual and physical death are the results of that failure, let's say it again, if failure and falling short is our lot, if we're, we're stuck in that, and if spiritual and physical death are the results of that, what hope do we have? Paul cries out in Romans 7, 24, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? That's our dilemma too. What wretched people we are, every one of us. Who is to rescue us? And Paul provides the answer in the, the very next verse. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to you, God, for delivering me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the answer to that life and death dilemma. And it is truly a life and death dilemma. Because with sin comes death. With Jesus comes life everlasting. Great, joyous, blessed, wonderful life everlasting. Paul gives a more complete explanation of this in Romans 3, 22 to 25 and 26b. Um, but I want to read, not the NIV, I want to read the New Living Translation because I think it's so much more clear. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. 
People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So this is our hope. Even in our continued sinfulness, because we're incapable of simply turning off our sinfulness. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to stop being sinful now and have it happen. It doesn't happen that way. It is our human nature to be sinful, and the Spirit helps us to defeat sin within us. Thank God. But it's still a process, a lifelong process of sanctification, because we still have the desires of the flesh pulling at us, pulling at us as we go through our lives. And we are weak. We are weak human beings. And so sometimes we give in to those desires of the flesh, and that is sin. And there may be any, many, many types of, of sin. There are many, many types of sin. It may simply be something like spreading a rumor or, or um, some little tiny white lie. But it's still sin. It's still the same thing. It's short of perfection. But Jesus is our hope. And over time, we become better and better. Until finally, the day comes when we pass from this earth and we become purified and perfect. And we stand before God in his heaven and live there eternally. Because, not because of us, not because... We did good things. You know, people today think, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I've done a lot of good things in my life. Well, guess what? That's not what the Bible tells us. It tells us we go to heaven because Jesus does a good thing in us. Not because we do a good thing. He does a good thing. He gives us purity through his sacrifice, dying on the cross. So how does all of this fit into our current sermon series on unity in Christ? Well, one of the effects of our humanness is that we can be judgmental and unforgiving. Isn't that true? We can be judgmental and unforgiving. And sometimes, God forbid, sometimes we can even be selfish. We can be selfish sometimes. Isn't that true? I know. We don't want to admit that to ourselves, but aren't we that way sometimes? Be honest. Don't we tend to excuse our own shortcomings while at the same time criticizing the shortcomings of others? Don't we do that? Yeah. He did that. Well, I did it yesterday. But he did it today, and he's wrong to do it. Don't we often rationalize why we should be forgiven for some offense of sin while we fail to forget the same offense or a similar one in somebody else? Because it's all about us, right? Of course we do. And what happens? This creates separation within a church family, or any family for that matter. My father was famous when I was a youngster, especially a teenager, for saying, do what I say, not what I do. And he meant it because he did things all the time that he said we could not do. You will not do this. I'm doing it. You don't do it. Does that make any sense? I've often pondered, been frustrated over these parents that swear like troopers but tell their children, don't you say it. I can say it. I'm, a parent. I'm an adult. I can say it. But don't you say, wouldn't it be better if they just didn't say it and were a good example for their children? That would be so much better. That's not the right way to teach our children. If you don't want your kids to swear, then don't swear. If you don't want your kids to take drugs, then don't sit home and smoke pot. If you don't want your kids to steal or lie or cheat, then don't cheat on your taxes. Because they see it. They see it happening. 
Don't expect others, your children or anyone else, to not do the things that you willingly do because you're not being a good example. And likewise, don't be critical of others when they commit the same sins that you commit. Well, he cheated on his taxes. He got caught. I know I had a relative once who got caught cheating on his taxes and did three years in a federal prison. But has anyone here ever just tweaked a little bit? Just a little, just to get a little more back? Maybe not. Paul says in chapter 14, verse 10, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. We should not treat each other with contempt. Of course, none of us here have ever done that. We're a happy church family, right? We all love each other, and that's the truth. We do all love each other. But we still have this humanness within us. We're all human. Or is it just me that has these failings? I don't think so. So the several definitions of the word human in the Merriam-Webster dictionary includes this one. Representative or susceptible to the sympathies and frailties of human nature. Doesn't that sound like us? We are human and we are all subject, susceptible to the frailties, the failures of human nature. It is inborn in us. Frailties, failures, shortcomings, sin. These are the lot of us as human beings. But God has given us a way out. And that way out is Jesus Christ. Without him, our future would be without hope. With him, with him, We are promised eternal life. So I'd like you to take a moment and just look around the room. Look at the other people who are in this room. And look at me, too. We are all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner. One is no better than the next. Because for God, any sin, one sin... Even the smallest sin is still a sin. They're all the same. Sin is sin. None of us is any better in God's eyes than any other. We all fall short. We all let our God and each other down. Consider that. Okay, so we let each other down in church. That happens. Doesn't it? Sometimes it happens. But do you know when you're letting somebody down in church, you're letting him down? That's a big thing. Seems like a little thing to let somebody down in church. It's a really big thing to let God down. A really big thing. So let's simply accept the fact that we're sinners. Acknowledge our own deficiencies. Not be self-grandizing, I think is a term. And then, as we recognize our own deficiencies, let us give grace to one another, just as God gives grace to us. Let us give forgiveness and love. Let us give help. Let us put aside our prejudices and our expectations of each other. Let us see in each other a child of God who is just trying to overcome human weaknesses and be the person that God wants us to be. Let us be encouragers to one another. Let us be helpers to one another. Because this is a really tough journey that we're on, isn't it? Through this world, this crazy world. And we start out with this deficiency of sinfulness right off the bat, we can't get away from it. But let's give each other a break and treat each other with love and care. Let us do it because it's right. Let us do it because Jesus asks us to do it. 
Paul wrote to the Christians of Philippi that Christ has offered them the greatest gift imaginable, the gift of himself. And he said in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Having the same love. That means having the love of Jesus toward one another. And of course, we should not just here in church, but also outside of church. The same love that Jesus gives, he gives it to us in abundance to share with others. We have been given the gift of Christ himself, and Paul's prayer applies to us just as much as it did to the Christians of Philippi. With Christ as our head, with Christ as our head, if we keep him in mind and in our focus, then we can be one in spirit. We can be of one mind. And if we are, can you imagine the things we can do for God in our lives and in the life of this church? Can you even imagine what we can accomplish? Because our Lord and Savior is a good God. Look at the things he's done in this church in the past couple of years. Look around you. It's amazing what our God can do. But he can only do it if we work together to accomplish it when he tells us. So let us praise our Lord. Let us serve our Lord. And let us love one another with the deep and abiding love of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so grateful that you gave us Jesus Christ as our Savior, that he willingly went on the cross and gave his life so that we might have hope for a future and everlasting life with you. But while we are here, Lord, help us not to keep our focus away from you, but to always keep focused on you, to serve you, to seek your purpose and do your purpose and do it together in oneness, helping, sharing, and loving with one another as Jesus has commanded. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Our final song is Grace Like